All right, hello everyone. Hopefully this is working. Everyone can hear me, right? How about now? That's better. All right, um, we'll get started here. Uh, my name is Earl Miles. Uh, many of you know me better as Merlin of Chaos. Uh, I am responsible for a lot of uh, important things in Drupal, uh, views, uh, the theme system back in D6, uh, and what I want to talk about today, uh, the panel stuff, which is a, a subsection of C-Tools is involved in this as well. Now, I'm going to apologize. Uh, if you came looking for a highly technical talk, uh, you're not going to get it. Uh, I only knew I was doing this on Friday, so I'm doing kind of an overview of what all these modules are. Uh, so what I'm going to say is if you look at this slide and you know most of what's on there, probably going to be kind of a boring presentation for you. For that, I apologize. Uh, if you don't know most of what's on here, hopefully this will be enlightening. Uh, hopefully I will give you a reason to uh, look at this stuff uh, and consider using it as part of your Drupal uh, site building experience. Uh, before I get started, um, are there, I don't know, hang on, I'll do questions again. Um, so I guess what I will do is uh, kind of start. Um, the panels family of modules uh, isn't really panels anymore. Uh, it, the whole thing started uh, as a project I initially called Dashboard, which was just a way to put uh, more than one piece of content in the content area in Drupal. Uh, back in the era of Drupal 4.6, when I got started, Drupal simply couldn't do that. It, it, the only way to do it would be to write custom code um, or to do weird tricks with blocks, which in fact people still do. Um, and then there are many reasons not to do that, not the least of which is performance, but also maintainability. Um, the, the weird trick with blocks, by the way, is what you do to uh, have special layouts that you put in through a preprocess or something on a page, uh, and then have blocks that only show up on those pages. But when you do that, <clears throat> what you don't necessarily realize is that whether or not your regions show up, your blocks render, like it or not. If you're using PHP visibility rules, the blocks may not render, but the rules still have to run and you have to go through that whole process. Plus, where you are configuring this has nothing to do with the content, so maintaining it is difficult, especially if you have a lot of these pages. Um, and I wanted to do... Uh, I thought it should be simple to say I want something on the left and something on the right on this page. Uh, I looked at Joomla and it could do that out of the box. Uh, and I'm like, why couldn't Drupal? Joomla isn't even that good, forgive me. Um, <laughs> uh, or not. But I mean, really, when I looked at Joomla, I didn't think it was that good. But there was this, what I thought, obvious feature right out of the box that Joomla could do and I wanted Drupal to be able to do it. It turned out um, doing it as a node had some good things and bad things. Uh, and that eventually progressed to panels where I added drag and drop, uh, which was a, an interesting, uh, that's how I learned JavaScript, by the way. Um, yeah, I broke, learned JavaScript so I could write drag and drop. Turns out that's not the best way to learn JavaScript. <laughs> um, unless you're masochistic, which uh, there is some rumor going around that I may in fact enjoy pain. Um, uh, so I wrote the, the drag and drop uh, because it's before jQuery UI existed. Nowadays we have jQuery UI, which is a pretty good uh, drag and drop, uh, but I haven't switched over to it because that's a lot of work um, to get rid of code, which is actually probably a good idea, but still it's not something I can just do overnight. Um, it then got worse uh, in the transition from Drupal 5 to Drupal 6. Uh, one of the things that panels did at that point was you could easily take over any menu item, uh, which you can still do with views for the most part, but some of the most important menu items to take over, node rendering, it turned out you could no longer take over cleanly because of the rewrites to the menu system. So we had to completely change the approach uh, to taking over menu items, which ended up splitting a lot of the functionality that used to be panels out into a new system called Page Manager. Uh, Page Manager is a module that is part of the Chaos Tool Suite, C Tools. Uh, which is sort of the library of things I think should have always been part of core. Um, a lot of it is just little tools that make life easy for me. A lot of it is little tools that make life easy for other people. 
like export stuff so that features, I mean, features does a lot of its stuff on the export. Uh, the plugin system, I know of a minimum of 30 modules that make extensive use of plugins. Uh, and I think plugins will probably make it in some form into Drupal 8. Um, export probably as well. It's kind of hard to tell at this point. Everything is in this early stage of initiatives where there's a lot of yelling back and forth. Uh, so what happened was the panel's family got broken up into a ton of di little pieces because I kept wanting to make the Drupal site building experience match how all the designers I talked to approached it. Um, I don't know, this feels like going back in time to me because I don't design a site this way, but a lot of people still do. Um, the cookie cutter Drupal sites you see, you have this block, this single block called your content, and a few blocks that decorate around it. It doesn't have to be this header, sidebar, footer thing. Uh, these days it's more complicated. You've got three footers, like Bartik has the triptychs and the whatever, I can't even remember, there's like a dozen of them that decorate. But ultimately, it's still this. It's just that what you've done is you've broken out the footer into little three and little four, and the header has a couple of different regions, and you know it's now sidebar first and sidebar second, so it's easy to turn around. But it still separates the content from the decoration. And I don't think most designers I've ever dealt with see it that way. They see this. I mean, I, I, I look at designs by people who don't make Drupal sites, and they design full pages. And you, you talk to people who are like, oh, well, that's not going to work in Drupal. That's not the Drupal way. And we have spent years teaching people that this is the wrong way to design pages. And I don't think that's right. Um, I think, really, designers want their page, and maybe these days they like grids because grids are cool. Um, so the idea of panels was to try and back up and make your pages whole entities. Um, and the content can be anywhere on the page. You can move pieces of content into that header and into the sidebars and into the footer. Because, I mean, look at a new site. Um, you've got your sidebars. Usually you've got your main article there, and the sidebar is going to have related links or uh, images that go with the news or pull out quotes, you know, things to draw the eye or things to to navigate from that piece of content to another piece of content. The, the things on a page should have something to do with what you're looking at. This is the web. For the last 15 years, the rule has been content is king. Drupal does not follow that rule. Drupal encourages us not to follow that rule. But content is king. Mobile is reminding us that content is king. When you have a lot less space to, design, to, to show stuff, you have to realize that all this stuff we're showing people, which we think is useful, is simply annoying them because what they're for is the content. And we need to make sure that what's on that page is related to the content and going to lead them to the next piece of content that they want. So now that I've done my soapbox bit, I want to back up <laughs> and uh, try to describe how this, uh, this suite of systems works together. Uh, it breaks up, let me go back, it breaks up roughly into three pieces, uh, and these, uh, well, three groups of pieces, really. And these break up after uh, a lot of thought based upon who's going to use them in a lot of ways. Uh, like, the, there's, there's your site builder, and that's your sort of developer type. Might be a developer, might be someone who's really, really good with Drupal and understands all the content and knows what all the options are, uh, and, and it really, really dug into your Drupal site. And they're building the site, and they're making it possible for uh, the next set of users, which are content managers, to maintain the site. But the site builder is probably not maintaining the site. The site builder, when done building a site, is probably going to go on and build another site. Your content maintainer manager, however, is going to take that site, and then, if your business model is sound, going to continue maintaining that site for 10 years. That's, you know, hey, uh, fantasy maybe, but that's what we would really like. So the structure is the stuff uh, used by your site builder. Uh, and they're building how your site navigates, uh, how you get from one piece of content to another piece of content, how your overall content is going to be organized. But your uh, content manager is using the content pieces 
and then components end up being used by both. <clears throat> and you need a way to make sure that your site builder has access to all the components and your content manager ha has access to the components they need without burying them with the components they don't. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out when you start looking at sites this way, it's easy to get overwhelmed in the amount of, uh, of little pieces of content that a Drupal site really gives you. Um, if you've uh, built a complicated site with a lot of blocks and been overwhelmed by the number of blocks available on our incredibly crappy block UI admin page, where you have no choice but to see every block available every time you load the page, and uh, I have actually been in an instance where a particular solar installation created over 200 blocks on its own, uh, and it turns out the JavaScript that runs our table sorts doesn't like that very much. It, it, yeah, it caused like a 12 second page load, uh, which I find unusable myself. I don't know about others. Yes, I do. Everyone finds it unusable. Some people think that's normal. Well, those people um, need to get out more. <laughs> Are they still on dialogue? <laughs> um, no, they need to get out more too. <laughs> um, uh, the amount of content that Panels makes available dwarfs that. Um, we tried to organize it, uh, but ultimately um, you still have the problem that there is a lot of content on any Drupal site um, and a lot of content that you're probably not using because this is a site builder tool. We're trying to make everything you might need available to you. Well, that's great for the site builder, terrible for the content manager. Um, so that's one of our uh, uh, interesting issues. I mean, look at over at the components, you can see that's completely dominating this list. Um, I've also got a MISC uh, column because it doesn't actually fit any of those other three um, of li little things that I kind of want to show off at the end. This. Um, the page manager page is most easily uh, described as, uh, who in here has used views? Good, you're all going to get it. There's a page display. You know, views has displays, and there's page block and uh, attachment. Well, the page manager page is the same thing as a views display. It offers you a path, um, which you can probably alias or whatever, and accepts arguments, uh, and then leads you to your view. Well, the page manager page does the same thing. You've got your menu item, the path. You can put it in the menu uh, pretty much the same way. You get tabs. Uh, in V7, you get local actions, uh, all that kind of stuff. You can uh, get arguments. But one thing it has uh, over views is views never knows anything about the arguments it's getting from the, from the system. And in fact, it's probably the biggest pain point uh, in views that I know of is that if you're using a URL, it's easy to figure out what arguments are. But in a block display, you have to actually really know how the system works to realize that blocks don't get arguments from the URL. Everyone thinks they will, but the system doesn't actually know what part of the URL was an argument and what part of the URL was the path that was described. So um, the, the, the advantage here is that when you decide what arguments your page has, you can assign it a context. And that tells Page Manager what kind of data that is. And you can use that to limit your page uh, or to even change what your page does. And that's what variants are. Um, the, the quick and dirty idea of a variant is you go to your site's front page while not logged in. Uh, and you're selling something. And you want people to log in in order to, to, to experience your site. So you're giving them a pitch when they're not logged in on the front page. Once they're logged in on the front page, you don't want to give them a pitch. You want to give them what they came for. So that's one thing a variant is great for, because it can say, on this page, if the user is logged in, give them this page, and it's a completely different page than if they're not logged in. Uh, but you can also do the same things for language uh, or other settings that they might have set. Uh, lots of little things that people can do with variants. It can be a hard thing to understand, uh, and it's unfortunate because most of the time you don't need variants and that system is there getting in the way until you actually need it and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my god, I'm so glad I have that. Um, uh, one of the great uses for it is region uh, specific content. Um, if you're uh, in a multinational site uh, like a, a popular uh, music company I might have been once associated with, 
um, they might want to have a different look uh, or push different content to different markets. Uh, and that's one thing variants can be very good at um, because you can say, well, this uh, variant is for the French market, so we're going to push the French artists, so we're going to use this view uh, and give them this and give them these ads. And after a while, it's like, well, this is really a different page. You know, it may look the same, but it doesn't have the same content. And if it doesn't have the same content, is it the same page? I don't think so. Um, and as a very important thing in almost all of my work, it's exportable, uh, which means you can turn it into a piece of code, and that piece of code can be put on another site or put into a module so that your module can use it. And by being exportable, that means it works with features. Um, and these days, features is all the rage for building sites. I did skip this, didn't I? Um, single hardest concept about this entire system is context. Made worse by the fact that there is a context module which has the same methodology with a completely different implementation. Um, the idea of context is you want to know something about the data that you're displaying in order to control how it's displayed. Um, good example of things context module does is create sections by taxonomy terms on nodes, does that very well. Uh, in fact, anything you can write a rule for, um, context module does that very well. Um, so in context module, a context is a set of rules that defines uh, a sort of overall system state. Uh, and then when you're in a particular state, you behave a certain way. In page manager and panels, uh, a context is actually an object. Uh, it is a piece of data. And this is probably a lot more to do with my way of thinking. Oh, and by the way, we came completely independently on these paths, and that's why we ended up completely in different places. We both knew we were dealing with context, and we had our own ideas to do it, and I didn't know they were working on this stuff, and either they didn't know I was working on this stuff, or they decided to ignore it. I'm not sure which. Um, either way, it's caused a problem in the, in the community because there are two completely separate ways of doing these things which people think are actually not compatible with each other. That's actually false. It turns out um, if you familiarize yourself with both systems, there are things context module does well that this system doesn't do as well, uh, and vice versa. And if you put them together, you can actually do really interesting things. Um, although the module that someone was working on to take a context module context and turn it into a C-tools context uh, has never actually been published. That's kind of an important piece. But what I do is you take discrete pieces of data, turn them into a context, and then a page uh, has a group of contexts. Um, so by context, we mean these kinds of things. Um, and with D7, also add entities to the list. Forgot to add it to the slide. Uh, but lots of things. That's how you get context, pretty easy. You take it from an argument, and you know that's a node, um, so you turn that into a context. Once it's in panels as a context, it has a name, uh, and you no longer refer to it as the node ID. You refer to it as the node that you have named, uh, which, like if you're using the node view template, then it's called node being viewed. Um, and if you've made a page that takes a node like that, you call it whatever you want. Sometimes it's just node. From that context, you get other contexts that are related to it, a taxonomy term attached to it. The author of the post gives you a user. Um, node reference module gives you all kinds of node references. Um, and you can go on into infinity, starting with entities, once that really gets taken. I don't think we've taken entities to anywhere near the level they can be yet. Uh, but the Drupal 7 version of context will do almost anything you want with entities, uh, except for the weird ones that Fago creates. Um, and then you take those contexts and render something about them. You use those contexts to create rules. You say, if this node is of type article, uh, render it this way, or render this pane, um, or whatever, uh, and render little bits of that uh, object in those boxes. Uh, and that's ultimately how you take a complicated piece of data um, 
and lay it out the way your designer saw it. Um, you start realizing when you have this, it's all data, and the problem becomes identifying it. Going up a level, um, the, the other part of structure is the block system blows. I'm sorry. I know there are people who like it, and I apologize to them, but I hate the block UI. I hate the whole system. Blocks are singular. You can have, you have a, a great example is there is a, a random image block. You can only have that one random image block in one region, period. You want two random images? Sorry, you can't do it. Um, because they're singular, their configuration is global. You configure it once, and it's always configured that way. You can't have that block in another context configured differently. Um, it is so annoying that when I try to use Drupal's block system blocks as panes, where I get rid of some of these rules, I still have trouble with configuration because it expects it to be configured globally, and it's looking directly at variables rather than taking information passed to it. Um, you have trouble controlling when your blocks are rendered. There are these block visibility rules, which are uh, interesting. But when you start relying on them heavily, you end up with this soup. Uh, on your block UI page, which is already barely usable as it is, now you have to identify why this block renders on this set of pages, or this block doesn't render on this set of pages, and you end up with regions that have 50 blocks that look like they're rendering, but I go to this page and four of them are rendering. Um, so you know, it, uh, how you pass that system to the per someone who didn't build it and say maintain this, I don't know. You know. When you build that system, I'm sure it makes sense. But that's because you have a mental map of what you were doing. There's no place in the system to write that mental map down, um, to pass it on. We just kind of expect whoever takes the system to look at those visibility rules. Hate them. Block visibility rules should die. Um, so I decided to write panels everywhere. Um, and instead of having the block UI, uh, oh, and you know this page template, who needs that? We take these layouts that panels uses, and we take all the content, and we take this page and say, hey, this page is here, and it looks like it needs this template, and smack it in, and you now have whatever blocks, wherever you wanted, rendered the way you want. Oh, and way better caching than block caching. Um, something I don't mention here, I forgot about. Um, there's a caching system that's pluggable, and the built-in caching system by itself is better than block caching, and it's still stupid. Um, if you have any knowledge of how caching works at all and a little bit of development knowledge and understand your system, you can write a superior caching module in about a day um, because you know the needs of your data, you know when it needs to be dirtied or how it needs to be dirtied, and you can have your page performing better with that plugin that you wrote in a day than you'll ever get with blocks ever because you can't control the caching model, period. Um, and with this, you can say, well, I know that this view that I have over on the right is very expensive, um, but it's different for every user. But I can at least cache it for every user, and that user will not be running this view every time he hits the site, which, say, I come to your site, I you know, visit 27 pages over the course of uh, 10 minutes. That's 27 times that I ran this view that takes 300 milliseconds to run. Uh, did I just take nine seconds of your CPU time for my 10-minute visit? for one view, that seems uh, bad and it's hard to fix in Drupal. Really, I mean, views caching can do it uh, uh, on its own as well. It has its own caching mechanism. But what if your thing isn't a view? Moving on from structure, um, this is something that got written early this year. So this is the newest piece of the the, panel, the panels family. It's called Panelizer. It's its own module, uh, which is a lot of people might not have heard of it. Panels itself comes with a module called Panel Node. Um, don't use it. It's obsolete. Panelizer is superior in every way. And the reason it's superior um, is this allows you to panelize any node type. You can go into the configuration and say, I have articles, and I have stories, and I have this story and that story. I want them to be panelized. Now the content editor can attach panels to them. I can control which layouts the content manager gets. And I can provide a default panel that they can just use. So 
give them the default panel, it's good for them to work with, they want it to be different, fine, they remove the layout, put their content in, boom, it's done. Um, you can use uh, CCK fields on your nodes, put the panes in the, uh, the layout, and they can control their content without necessarily actually editing the panel as well. It's another cool thing you can do with it. Um, and the system was written such that it's meant to have things like multiple uh, default panels that they could choose from. Uh, there's no UI for that yet. It doesn't actually work, but it, 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 the structure is capable of it. Uh, it's meant to be able to panelize more than just nodes. So someday this will be able to panelize users and hopefully any entity which has a, a render system if someone wants to work on it. Uh, it also uh, is designed so that you could have multiple panels per node so that you could easily just say, well, this node has three panels and there are these tabs or whatever that get to the panels so that you can separate the data of a single node across tabs easily from just that node without having to go to some other UI. Um, this is completely a content uh, manager's system. Uh, and the site builder probably shouldn't use this because, well, downside, you can't export these because they're nodes. Um, you don't really export your nodes and put them into code. But the upside is this stuff appears in your search because Drupal's search is dumb and can only search nodes. Um, because, you know, when search was written in Drupal 4.4 or whatever, maybe it was even earlier than that, uh, the author of it didn't realize that you might have content on your system that isn't a node, um, which is kind of an odd assumption to make, I thought. But there it is. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I have a lot of slides to get through, so I am pushing kind of quick. The next bit are the large number of components uh, available um, that you can create and they're customized. Um, and I don't even talk about all the stuff that's provided for you, which is all the blocks, all the pieces of uh, uh, views and all the pieces, well, actually views that you talk about, all the pieces of nodes uh, and all the little things that are already there. But the custom content, um, which is write a fairly easy to write plugin um, to create your blocks, uh, which I think also are organized a little bit better than hook block view, um, especially if you have a lot of different blocks. Uh, but also in the UI, um, you can create the simple text area with uh, an input filter, uh, reuse that and have it exported so that it becomes part of your site code, um, even though it was created from the UI. Um, content can be anything. I mean, that's the beauty of, of Drupal. Um, so this is a weird piece of data, in my opinion, because um, sometimes it's pure content, sometimes it's an ad, sometimes it's a note. Um, but it's a, it's a really common thing to do. And because it's an input filter, you can abuse PHP if you really want. Custom layouts. Um, these are your page template. Um, you, we create plugins. Uh, layouts are really, really simple. You have your template. Um, you have a, a .ink file, uh, which has a structure in it that looks a lot like a .info file in your theme, where you define what the regions are you define what your template is called, uh, and you define a CSS file. Um, if your layout is really complicated, you can also uh, define a separate administrative version of the layout so that the uh, drag and drop editor isn't burdened with all of the uh, decorations that you might need um, or JavaScript that might be attached to it. Um, but there's also the um, flexible layout builder, which I love and hate. Um, it is the code in Drupal that I am 100% the least proud of um, and wish someone else had written, but I have to take credit for it, or blame as it may be. But it does allow you to build a layout uh, with sliders, so you can say I want this region on the left, uh, and I want these regions over here, and I want this one to be 50%, and I want this one to be 200 pixels. You can provide classes, uh, and you can embed CSS right there into it, um, so that it controls how it does, which is great for people who don't want to get into the files behind it. Uh, the more I use Drupal, the more I realize that people don't really want to mess with the, the template files that we give them. So this stuff is there as an option for people who don't want to mess with the custom layouts. Personally, I think everyone should be using the plugins and writing their layouts. But 
it's a good option for the quick and dirty. The, the one great thing about this is you can sit down with a client and go, oh, do you want this? And, you know, whip it together. And then, boom, there's your layout. Throw in some dummy content because lorem ipsum is easy to cut and paste. Uh, and you can show them uh, what kind of things are possible and then go back in and redo the layout later. Um, I mean, because of the way the code is written and the HTML it generates is not the most efficient, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what it is. But it is a useful tool. And just in case you didn't know what a layout looks like, pass that. Um, panels also has styles, um, which you can apply to panes and regions. Um, and sometimes you can laughingly see, oh, hey, this site was done with panels because uh, that cheesy rounded corners style that it comes with. It's like, oh, yeah, I recognize that. Uh, it can be made to look good. Um, and But it does a lot more than that. Um, you can do a lot with it uh, because you can apply specific CSS just by changing the style. Um, you can also do crazy things like turning panes into tab sets and accordions and uh, there's a three or four different kind of strange sort of not truly styles things that people have done with it. Um, and there's the stylizer module which actually um, when I wrote it I was reading color module um, which is shipped with Drupal 6 and uh, should be called Garland module because that's the only thing it's useful for and said well what if we did this better um, tried to make it something more generic and what it does is allow you to take uh, a generic style recolor it and pick CSS elements from the UI so uh, what it comes with is a, a rounded shadowed corner uh, box which you can control the uh, color of and you can control the font colors, uh, the font size, the font type, weight, uh, border style, title color, a few other things. Um, and, you know, from the UI, do some quick style creations. You can create these generically, export them, uh, and then just apply them as you need them. Uh, the, uh, there's some downsides here, like the actually applying a style to a pane, I think, is a little hard to do still. Um, I, really will someday fix that UI, promise. Um, but uh, it, it is really nice once you're using them. And the, the interesting thing is when you start using styles this way, um, it does force your designers to try to build pieces of pages that can be separated from the page. Uh, and you start learning that some of the, the rules of CSS um, stop applying the same way because when you start separating elements from the page and you don't know the context they're in, the cascading and cascading style sheets does strange things. Um, but once your designers have realized that, they actually, I think, uh, become more flexible designers uh, because they quit falling into the trap that uh, everything has to know its context all the way to the top. Um, and you start building more pluggable bits that can be assembled rather than a design that can only work, say, in the sidebar. Um, biggest problem in the whole system is you can turn on the block style, which is supposed to make your uh, panes appear in the style of the block from your theme. And nearly every theme in Drupal only activates that style if it's in a sidebar, which isn't all that useful because chances are you're using this in your main content area. So you turn it on and nothing happens and you realize it's because your the theme has CSS that is too specific um, because of the cascading and cascading style sheets. I don't think there's that much to say about mini panels. Um, it's a panel in a panel in a panel. It's a it's a matryoshka. <laughs> um, you know, you got your little doll inside your little doll inside your bigger doll um, and you can go way too far with this but it's really a, a handy tool for you got a bunch of content you put together like you have a common sidebar where you've got a bunch of layouts that are just a little bit different but these parts are the same well you can turn that into a mini panel so at least you'll have to put in that one pane every time 
It's also good for, you got your, your blocks in your sidebar, and that one in the middle is actually two blocks side by side. That's fun to do in Drupal. Um, Mini panels actually does that one for you very, very easily. Um, the views pane is uh, obviously one that I am close to, having written both sets of modules. Um, and that's my take on the block display. Um, it's actually shocking what you can do with it that no one knows. Um, because the problem here is you get used to the way page displays work and block displays where you define everything within the view. But with this system, what you really want to do is define everything you want to never change within the view, within the view, and then turn the rest of it so that you can configure it within the pane where you add the view. And then you have to kind of guess or know what's never going to change and what is going to change. Um, it also lets you just add views from whatever display into your panel. The downside there is that means everything is configurable because it doesn't know what should be configurable and what shouldn't be. This one you can ask it. But you can also do, um, like the, the bottom two here, um, controlling which fields show up. Um, that's really, really handy uh, when used with the view context where you have a pane that's displaying row number one and you want it to be a richer view because it's the, the lead story of, of say like four and you're showing a larger teaser and an image that you wouldn't show with the others. We have all those fields in your view and in row one you pick I want these fields and in row two, three, and four you pick I want these other fields which are showing you less. Um, smaller image because of image cache, cool things like that. But the, the, the bottom one there is the exposed filters, instead of being exposed to the user, they're exposed to the content manager. And you end up being able to give your content managers these little mini views UIs where they only have to deal with five or six or three or four, however many you give them, filters. Uh, or uh, there's actually exposed filters don't have to just be filters anymore. They can also be sort and uh, a couple of other little things like how many appear. And that all goes in to the pane config, they configure it, they get what they want. Content managers get a much better experience. They don't go to the views UI at all. Because really, when you start giving the content managers the views UI, you are hurting their brains. Um, there's just too much there. It's, it's to, to really get the most out of views, you have to understand your data architecture. Content managers don't want to know about that. They want to know about content. Speaking of views context, um, if you want to really know about views context, uh, uh, Johan, uh, what's his last name, of Node 1? Falk, yes. Um, made a couple of 15 or 20 awesome uh, videos. One of them is uh, about the views context. And it, 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 I don't know, I think just talking about it doesn't really show you what it does. On, if you've ever wanted to take a view and split it into columns. If you've ever wanted to take a view and say, after the third item, I want to insert an ad. Um, if you've ever wanted to take a view and put the pager somewhere else, you, all these little things that you have to go through kind of hurdles to do, you can do them with templates and, and other strange stuff. Or you load the view as a context and then put in your panes. Top pane, row one, display these fields. Next pane, row two, display these different fields. Below that, an ad. Then another pane which says rows three through seven, uh, an ad. Then whatever. Uh, or in the next column. Uh, you can get incredibly um, de deep in how you display your view by loading it into a context. You can also, uh, if it's a view displaying rows of nodes, get the fully loaded node object that it displays and then display any content related to that node. Uh, including node reference content uh, or other things that might not have been in the view. Um, custom rule set, uh, it's just a way to say I have a bunch of different rules put together um, that I'm going to use a lot. Um, I don't think people use this too much, but it's there. Um, it's an interesting little piece. Um, panel fields, um, I think this is great. Um, because one thing people have often wanted with uh, views is to take 
say, an image and float it to the left and then group these two fields together and group these two fields together. And you can do it, but it's a pain in the butt because the views template is trying to go through this loop of all your fields and it doesn't have any way to know which fields you want these divs around. This does it easily. You create your layout with uh, whatever uh, divs or HTML elements you want with whatever classes you want and say I want uh, field A on the left, fields B, C, and D in the middle, field E on the right. Uh, the layout is going to be pixel perfect. Done. Um, I use this almost every site I've been building lately because it turns out it's just really nice, if nothing else, to have that image in one column, which, which is set to the width of the image I'm using, and the other fields next to it uh, as an easy way to do it. Um, but th that's, you know, just the surface of what it can do. Uh, and the last piece of the miscellaneous stuff, um, I don't know huge amounts about Display Suite. Uh, it w at one point was accidentally being pitched as the anti-panels. It's not. And to prove it, the author of Display Suite went ahead and implemented the panels API with Display Suite. So not only is it the anti-panels, it can do panels for you. Um, you can have the panel editor on the Display Suite node page and use it to put all your fields and whatever content you want and use all of the panel layouts uh, rather than just the dozen or so the Display Suite provided for you. Um, and this means you have a UI which is closer to your node, your uh, content type UI uh, and the field UI so that it's right there where you're controlling what's in how, it, how it's being laid out together. Uh, it's an alternative way to do the node view and actually probably better than the page manager version for most purposes. Um, I would highly recommend anyone who needs to do really complicated node layouts to check out Display Suite. Even if you don't use the panels part of it, uh, it's still really cool. Um, but I think once you add panels to it, it just goes over the top. Yes, sir? Where, where is this in um, the, the question is, where does this in Panelizer uh, overlap? The, the difference here is when you use Display Suite to control a node, every node of that type uses that panel. With Panelizer, when you create a node, you say, I want to panelize it in this way, and it's per node. Now, you can give it a default, and it will use that, in which case they're kind of the same. But with Panelizer, the uh, content author always has the option, or someone at that level, maybe not the author, but a content editor, always has the option of saying, on this node, I want a different layout. And you don't have that option with Display Suite. It doesn't do per node. It's per node type. Could you do predefined sets of panels that, that you give the user access to? So Some. You lock them into that set, or you always up to your default when you use it? Someday. That, the code wants to do that. It does not yet do that. Um, I need a development resource uh, or funding, okay. either one. Um, but yeah, that's some place I really want it to go. Um, and it, it, that's part of uh, another piece of expansion I want to do to panels, which also involves region locking, um, where you could have a content editor able to edit most of a panel, but not these panes, for example, uh, because they're really important and you don't want to move them. It turns out many layouts end up having those, no matter how hard I try to convince people not to. Sometimes you just need to prevent the content managers from moving this really important pane. So that's a, a feature that I uh, do hope to get to work on someday. Lastly, um, I don't want to come off as too arrogant. Oh my god, this does everything. There are some real pain points in this system. Um, well, I, there's too many ways to do views. Uh, like I was saying, there's a system where you can just add a view. Um, I tried to get rid of this, actually, because I don't think it's the right way to do it. But too many people want the ease of just throwing their view in. Um, and I understand, because the way I think is right to do it means you have to go create your display on the view, then you can go to panels and put it in, whereas with this one, you can go to views that are already created, put them up, boom, it's simpler, it's quicker, but it's also more in your face. There's, there's too many options, and you don't have the ability to use context with the view, which maybe you don't need. But once you start needing it, you have to go to the other method. And once you're mixing methods, I don't know, I, I find that is always a bit of a pain to maintain. Um, we still don't have a good way to override the user registration form. Because user save is the weirdest function 
ever. Uh, it just it, go go look at the code for user save sometime. I mean, it, it node save at least takes a node and saves the node. User save actually takes an edit form and saves the pieces of the user that were there and not other pieces. And it's like I, I've always been intimidated trying to get that to work. Um, I haven't really mentioned it, but uh, uh, one of the things you can do with the page manager stuff is override your node edit forms. But you can't override your user registration form because it's easy, sort of, to override the user edit form and, and move the, the blocks around and change your fields around and change the order and, and, and all that. That's great, very helpful. Really wanted on users, uh, want user module to catch up to the, I don't know, 90s would be good. Um, but at least the, the, the 20th century or 21st century would be really good. Um, modules that don't talk panels and page manager, um, that can be a real pain point um, because you get used to being able to put your content where you want it and having mod the, all this content available granularly. And then you run into, uh, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, uh, Commerce is, is working with it great now, but there were, there were some that they want to override this page and make it look better, and they can't because the page didn't talk panels. It didn't make the content that should be on the page available. There isn't an override for the page, and you have to go in and do it. And uh, that that can be frustrating. Um, and I don't have a good solution for that. It's part of the design of Drupal, and um, I'm kind of stuck with it. Um, and even trying to replace the block system as much as I can, it still sucks and spreads the suck. Um, there are there are blocks in the system that you have to configure to work properly. Uh, the HTML menu, uh, some of the solar blocks. What I would want to be able to do is configure that block from within the panel when I do it, and it, I can't repurpose the form properly. And I don't know. Maybe I should try it again in Drupal 7 uh, and see if I can do it. But in Drupal 6, I actually had code in there for the longest time that did it. I eventually turned it off because it kept breaking more often than it was useful. Uh, and I just I couldn't make it work. Um, and just it, it makes me crazy. Um, blocks are a design that was probably written in about a day and hasn't really been updated in what eight years. Uh, I mean that that's how old this technology is. They changed the API here and there. They added drag and drop to the block UI and they added they split up the function so it's not just hook block, it's hook block view and hook block list. But the overall system is still the same. It's, oh, oh, they did make it so that most blocks in the system are now using descriptive uh, deltas rather than just numbers. So at least a block user zero is no longer your navigation pane or whatever it was. Um, that's, that's a nice touch. But I mean, overall, it's still just a, a horrible system. Um, hopefully the, the, the whiskey initiative in Drupal 8 will fix that. We're trying to do smart content and replace blocks with it. We'll see if that actually works out. That would be the end, and I have 10 minutes left for questions. Whew. All right, we'll start over there. Uh, have you done any uh, performance benchmarking on Hannah? I did it yeah. at the one. It looked really heavy, so I kind of didn't right. look at it again. Um, so the question is, have I done any performance benchmarking on panels? Um, I have not done the performance benchmarking. Sam Boyer did a bunch of it. Um, the short version is, using panels to override node view with exactly the same stuff that's on the node view page uh, resulted in a 7% uh, addition uh, to performance of which half of that was attributable to a bug. Um, so yeah, you're going to add a little bit of performance because you're loading your layout and it, it, there, there's more to it, but it wasn't that much and you can get rid of some of it, but he did determine that it added four queries of which three of those queries will go away if you export your panel and put it into code. Um, so panels is heavy in that there's a lot to it. I mean, I just spent 45 minutes going, here's these components, here's all this. Yeah, there's a lot of UI there. Actually rendering a panel is a lot quicker than you think. And most people who find performance problems in panels have not added up all the stuff that's in the panel. You put seven views on a panel with no caching, even if those are fast views and they only take 20 milliseconds to run the query and another 40 milliseconds to render or whatever, seven times six is 420. But hey, you just turn it into a half second page render just on those views because you didn't turn on any caching. And there are people out there who not only have done this and have blamed panels, 
but have written essays saying why they can't use panels because it performs slowly. But how did they get the same result with something without panels without caching those views? I mean, either you don't put the views on the page, and I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out views because it's the obvious thing, but there are other things you can put there that perform poorly as well. Uh, you know, something that's going to node load 50 nodes, um, I, you're never going to get that to perform well. Even in Drupal 7 where node load is faster, it's it just it's a lot of data loading. There was one over here. Um, so the question is, uh, will I put in more granular permissions in Panelizer? Uh, now, you can already control what content shows up per panelized node. Um, there's a link which goes to uh, a content selection page, which I'm going to admit is pretty horrible UI because it's a sea of checkboxes. But um, it lists all the content that it knows about in the system, and you can say, don't make this available. So you can turn the amount of content way down to stuff that's just relevant. Um, and, but it, it only, it is a one thing, it's, you know, this panelizer can have this content and you can't do it per role or anything nice like that. That would be the same reason, so, um, we have, like, two levels of Right, so, if, if you want the multiple roles bit to work, um, it's, it's doable. Um, my, uh, my question is going to be how to make the UI even possible. I mean, you're, I'm already giving you the sea of checkboxes. Now I have to give you another level. So you say, make, first you have to pick a permission or a role or something, and then you get a sea of checkboxes. Now you have multiple seas of checkboxes. Um, and I'm sure there's a way to do this. Um, my experience with UI is at that level, I need someone really, really solid to spend weeks figuring out ways to do stuff like that in a way that's not going to just kill you. So yes, I would like to. I'm sure it's possible to hack something in um, so that we could maybe turn that on optionally and not burden most people with it. Taking that up and up, would, would in Drupal, uh, next iterations of Drupal 8, 9, I know that they're talking about the permission system again and how it can be refactored to allow multiple modules to participate on a hierarchy of permissions. Uh, is that something that would help the process? Um, talk, uh, there's, the question is, uh, in Drupal 8 and 9, there's some effort to refactor the permission system. Would that help? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, just it, repeating it for the audience. Yeah, so so if, if in Drupal 8 or 9 something right. is done, the way permissions are assigned, because I know node access is pretty much like the default and, and what everybody looks at. But if, yeah. if, can panels offer its own permissions in for something like that? Um, so uh, could panels offer its own permissions in? It's a little tough. Um, you can override the node access system, access system with, uh, say, the panels access system. Uh, actually reasonably well with a little piece of code to override the access control on node edit. Uh, and then do everything else with views uh, and control your access that way. I think that's a great way to do uh, granular access control when you've got lots of control over your site uh, and you've got experienced team. I don't know what they're talking about for sure in the refactoring in Drupal 8. I haven't paid attention to that particular uh, piece of initiative. I think it's fairly new and I've only caught a few bits of conversation about it. I know that with Workbench that they were working on what? for seven. The concept was there would be some type of hierarchy in cascade. Um, currently, that's I, not I would love uh, cascading hierarchy. I actually did some pen and paper work, uh, napkin work on that. I couldn't figure out a way to make it performant. Um, that's the downside to it is like 
hmm, a hierarchy, great, works perfect, exactly what we want. Um, Unix administrators will love it because it just fits with a lot of enterprise access control, but it's slow. I mean, you've got to calculate down this hierarchy, and the depth of your hierarchy is going to require processing. And I couldn't figure out a way to do it quickly. I'm hoping they will. Uh, I, I don't know everything. Um, the, there may be algorithm, algorithms that make it work. Uh, I got, I think, time for like one more question. Um, is there any thought of bridging the gap between context module, uh, their context, and my context? That's whiskey. I mean, uh, literally, it's it's not as true now because most of DevSeed have pulled out of the Drupal community, um, and they gave most of their Drupal stuff to Phase 2, and Phase 2 does not have the resources that DevSeed did, so they're not as deeply involved. But the original, um, what is it? Uh, it's, it's led by Larry Garfield. It's WSCCI, something core context initiative. I can never remember exactly what it means, but it's whiskey. And the idea is to introduce context deeply into Drupal um, and to make smart content. And it would borrow concepts from both of these systems and try to put it within Drupal. And it would solve a lot of problems for a lot of people if Drupal itself understood these paradigms, because then everyone would be forced to code around it. and all the content in the system would be much, much smarter. As for Drupal 7, I don't know. Um, I don't know that context module is even really being actively developed anymore uh, unless phase two has more resources than I know about to put onto it. Uh, I know that they're struggling to keep up with the array of DevSeed stuff. I mean, DevSeed had a lot of stuff. And they had some very, very sharp people that could put out a lot of code on it. And I'm not sure they understood how much code they really were doing. And features is right there at the top of the list of things people care about, so it gets the most. Um, although context is important, too. I mean, whitehouse.gov uses it, so um, there's a, a bit of an important uh, customer that Phase 2 cares a lot about. So I'm sure it's getting some love. Um, yep, and that's my time. So thank you very much for attending.